what we really think of Vallejo. I think they're some of the best metallics for either brush or airbrush usage. Their names are so unbelievably useless. Panzerfaust firing pin shadow color blue. That's a terrible <laughs> name for a painting. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Certain colors are labeled as metallics uh, and same, and maybe they're not specifically actually within metallics, it's within the model air. Within model air, some of them are, <laughs> some of them are metallic. Are you following this? I'm, I'm lost, so I'm so, so lost. lost. Right, we're back. Mm -hmm. EMC two. James took me uh took me yeah, on one of the siege weekend. courses. Yeah. How was it? Actually, did you enjoy it? It was quite a it's quite an experience. Yeah. It's interesting watching you like you know when you like see a teacher from school when you're like in the supermarket. Yeah. It was kind of like that. The but opposite. With, but with James, yeah. But like the opposite way, like seeing him as a teacher. Yeah. 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 The other way round, essentially. That's what I said. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. Opposite. That's literally. That's what the, so when people literally. say the opposite, it means just yeah, concurring. It normally means <laughs> normally means the other way round. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was good fun though. It was uh, met some met some wonderful people. Yeah. Nice, yeah. I didn't. I, I wasn't there. I'm not interested in meeting anyone from who listened to the podcast. If you see me, <laughs> do not do not approach. <laughs> did you get recognised once before? <laughs> yeah, I did actually. Yeah. No, I do love it. I'm only joking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so deadpan. Then yeah. I was like, okay. Yeah. No, I love it. Yeah, but uh, I think I, yeah, I might have been the first person out of all of us to have a story of like, oh, I got recognised. James got James, James got recognised anyway, anyway though. Yeah. So Can't it's just out of us two, really, out, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's only us two, really. Who this is the first time we've been on camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That no, was good. good really, it was really good class. Um, I said we had lots of good students down. It's EMC two, so it's like the more advanced one. So things like uh, plasma glow, more advanced blending, glazing, all those kind of things. We had like a uh, on the Saturday we had like a uh, uh, George done some judging. So on the Saturday, oh, oh yeah, did, so yeah. we had the, the best leather uh, gun uh, holster. So we got all the students to do a whole in a very short space of time, which was good. Um, and then George basically decided, and the winner, who's a guy called Dan, if you're watching this, Dan, he won uh, he won a t-shirt off the store. So oh nice, so that was quite good. Cool. Um, We're just giving these t-shirts away lately. Yeah, everyone yeah. <laughs> sits on the bar to for achievements and win ones. Yeah, what can we give one away for this week? Is there anything you can think that of? That reminds me, I've actually got to give Ben his t-shirt. So I've got to message him. Yeah. So, oh, it's yeah. Ben who found your uh, old YouTube channel. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, there's some comments about that. Don't yeah. you worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a really good class. Um, yeah, obviously George wasn't there for day two, but there was some stuff happening on day two. So, oh. so day two, we, we do we do more sort of advanced stuff. So we do like blending on armor. We do like plasma glow and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, sorry, just to go over. So this was the EMC two. Yes. So we... EMC is the normal two-day class that we yeah. run that we've run for years, right? Uh, eight or nine years, yeah. yeah. EMC yeah. Essentials it, Masterclass, Masterclass. Yeah. yeah. And then the uh, EMC two, EMC two is a, a continuation of that, so is, more yeah. in-depth techniques and things like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that like technical sort of techniques and stuff that you can learn <laughs> practice. Technical, sorry, technical, 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 technical techniques. Technical techniques. Yeah. We're off to a good yeah. start in that. usual yeah, paint perspective that. format. What what better fitting thing for episode 50 than yeah. James right off the cuff. Technical with techniques. Technical techniques. Yeah, the TT. Are. The TT, yeah, yeah of, of Minch Pain. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's the, you, what you learn on the MC1, you obviously go away from that, get, get better at it through practice and repetition. Then the MC2 allows you to use that to then push yourself further, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, so... In the morning, the morning session is actually um, is actually like blending on armor. So we do things like shoulder pads, and we do things like that. And we had a lot of really good students on on the class uh, who'd come on previous classes. We had some new faces that had come on the MC two just as like their first class and stuff. Um, but Ollie Weaver, I just want to say a big thank you for this because he was very generous at the end of the of the end uh, of the class. He came up to me and said, "Look." I understand George is really struggling with his blood angels at the minute. So he's donated you a blended shoulder pad <laughs> to add to your army. You now have a blended shoulder pad with a bloom highlight and some transition on there. I haven't done the shoulder pads yet, to be fair. So, so I'm not one, surprised. One closer. That doesn't, doesn't surprise me in the slightest. That has added a significant... It's a very nice shoulder pad, by the way. Uh, yeah, that has added a significant percentage onto your total completion of your that's army. That's a non-significant so. percentage. I'll say that. That's like 15 or 20 points worth of my blood angels. Right yeah, there. exactly. Yeah. 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 So yeah. It's, so like, it's like five percent more of a, of a Marine. So, yeah. so yeah, there you go. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Little, yeah. little gift for you there. Yeah. So you've had, you're doing all right out of this I'm doing podcast. all right for the gifts, yeah. You've had your refreshers. Yeah. And now you've had a little, no, little three, a three little shoulder pads. Yeah. And if we're valuing this in terms of like time investment, I'd say this is, you know, this is up there. Yeah, 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 hundred yeah, percent. Been donated the gift of time. <laughs> you can't get can't get better than that. <laughs> it's the best gift. Like, yeah, yeah. So there you go. Okay. 
Uh, should we do the listeners' comments? I'm going to do my best to ruin this podcast as much as possible so you have to do as much editing as possible so that you then have to spend the time. The the, you, you have to then waste <laughs> the time editing that you have been gifted. Well, we've already wasted about five minutes because we did start filming this podcast and then James realised about 10 seconds in that he'd forgotten to get this out of his car and then proceeded to run into the car park <laughs> and come back absolutely heaving out of breath. Yeah. I'm still recovering from that. Yeah. 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 So you've yeah potentially eliminated some of the time that was saved mm -hmm. anyway there. So yeah. That makes me happy. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listeners' comments. Uh, Cranasty says... Uh, forget the sponge for weathering. Get out a Maris Piper. Spud chop. I mean, look, I'm all about getting new new kind of like hacks and things like that. I think that's probably the best one we've done so far. Spud, spud chop is spud just chop, yeah. absolutely brilliant. The yeah. the way, uh, do you know what? I said to George after, I was like, I'm so glad I pulled him up on the potato thing because yeah. it could have just gone under the radar. And I'm oh, glad no. I mentioned it because that sparked uh, a sort of, Generation, I think, is the yeah, word. like the two generations of people arguing with each other as to whether they remember potato painting or not. Potato um, Gate, I believe, the uh, community yeah, yeah. has coined that the, uh, segment. Spud Chop was Spud Chop is brilliant. It's genius. absolutely amazing. Um, and I think that does lead us into potentially a challenge in the future. I, I'm up for some kind for of a spud, spud Chop challenge. Spud it even chop. makes great name as well. Yeah. Like, I like yeah. the idea of vague rules for what the potato has to be used for, yeah. and the points are awarded on creativity with how the potato is used. I did float the idea when we we were talking about it uh, in the office, and I said if we did that, what I might do is scoop out the potato, <laughs> pour a load of contrast paint in it, and then just dip the model in that. <laughs> And then pull the model out and I'll have a contrasted model and I'll be like, yeah, let's use so it. You're going to dip used... wash a model in a potato. Yeah, and I'll be, like, I'll, use, yeah. I'll, I'll be like, yeah, that's potato painting. I use the potato. I mean, yeah, then I won't works. have to actually use the potato to paint. You're looking at me like I'm mental when the, op when the opposite, <laughs> the other option is you're using a potato to paint it. <laughs> Like, I think it'd be quite good actually. You're looking at me like I'm the lunatic. No, well, I, I think it'd be quite good. How would you use the potato? Well, I've got immediately two things come to mind. One, you, you cut a nice slice, and because it's wet, because the potato's damp and moist, you can use it to dilute paint on it. So it could be a good little palette. No, but no, no, no. The potato needs to be the brush. Never mind. No, the I don't palette. think there was any rules on no, that. Yours isn't the brush. Yours is a <laughs> reservoir of paint. What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah. No, 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 no. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. The potato needs to be what? is applying the paint to the model. But you putting a model in a reservoir, not, it's not touching... Where's the reservoir? Please? <laughs> that's not, I mean, Where's I know, the reservoir? I know I like stretching the rules, but that's a bit Where's far. the reservoir? The reservoir is the potato. The potato is what is getting the, the paint onto the model. You can't... It's not, let's use a potato as a palette. That's ridiculous. Oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. That would yeah. be the line, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But a reservoir for paint. I Absolutely do want to normal. test. The, I do want to test if we could do the using the stamp. The on stamp a, for the transfer thing. Yeah. Well, I guess that is the spirit of the potato painting. We've come to be very educated on potato painting now. And I just want yeah. to say, I've got to throw this out there. I was absolutely vindicated to maximum amount in the comments. There were so many people backing me up for painting with potatoes in their childhood. There was one person I can't remember the name. You have to forgive me, and we'll, I'll try and remember it if I can. But that one person commented that it made them relive their childhood. That is the best result I, don't I could know about, ever want from, from bringing a potato up in this podcast. I don't so, know about you, Joe, but I've had probably 20 or 30 people in my DMs mansplaining what the potato painting yeah, was I, as a child at this point. I, I understand. I was out with like completely non-Warhammer friends last Friday and they're my age and and a couple of years younger. Yeah, so it's like... Yeah. It's a, it's somewhere they're sitting between me and George age wise, the group of people. And uh, there was a bit where there was like, there was uh, four of us and I put it to them and I just, no context. I didn't mention anything. I was like, I just said, did you ever used to do potato painting in school? All three of them said, yes, they all knew exactly what it was. They, by me saying that term, they knew exactly what it was. Well, I'll make it worse for you uh, because of my friend group, of whom some are older and younger, 
they all knew what it was as well. <laughs> so, so it's not uh, a generational so, uh, thing then. It's I just, don't know how me and you, it just slipped under the radar maybe, of our childhood. Maybe the day in school that it happened, you were both ill. I mean, that, I just, I think. Yeah, but even around the office, like Ray, Ray said that she didn't do it as a, as a kid either. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just think potentially, I don't remember that much about school, to be honest. <laughs> so I reckon potentially I did it and I just don't remember. Maybe. Okay. Well, uh, Steve Murray says, I can't believe George and Joe hadn't heard of potato painting. I feel like my childhood is being erased. Next, you'll be saying you never used flour and water as paste for sticking random bits of pasta to a piece of paper. I did that. Now, oh, I, I, got was... some, I, got some, I got some news for you, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what was that again? Explain the, that last the, one. The, uh, see, this one I've heard of, but I actually didn't do what, this. What was it? The pasta, like sticking it to yeah, stuff. Yeah, you make that I never good. did that either. No, I didn't do that either. I I'm actually not kidding, by the way. I didn't. Do I that did. Stuff. I know what that is. Though. That's um, like a. I did a like, I did uh, paper mache. Yeah. So making made like a out of a balloon. I remember made, the balloon. Made, I made yeah. like a pig. Yeah. Where you do like the. You lost me at pig. I'm gonna no, you make honest, a pig. But... You make a pig. Maybe that was just my creativity flying through, and I made a pig. But I don't know if the. If, so the the. <laughs> is a pig to, the default paper to, mache <laughs> character? <laughs> I think so for a balloon because you use like. You know, like an egg carton. Yeah. So you like cut the individual egg carton, like container things out. So say you got six or something. Right. You got four you can use as little feet. You got one for the snout. <laughs> okay. And then one spare. But then like, but then, then the little balloon bit is like a towel, I guess, like a little, little springy towel. You That's pop, what I remember. You, don't you pop the balloon once it's set though? Yeah. I don't think I did. You're supposed to, you do the paper mache and then once it's hardened, you pop the balloon. I don't think I did that. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's what the other cart, the egg thing's for. I don't think your creativity was that exact. I think misunderstood the assignment. Well, I made a pig. <laughs> what did you do? Next. <laughs> Warzels says, completely agree with George here. I feel like fine art and art in particular lives in this strange world where people seem to assume you're either talented or not. All skill improves from practice and without trying. And taking that first step, you can't improve. Watching YouTube tutorials doesn't get you anywhere unless you start painting. Free model of the month from GW is the perfect test model. Do you know what? I know this isn't the point of the comment at all. Mm. The free model thing. Yeah. I've only ever heard of this. What I, is the deal here? I think, uh, I think GW do a... I, again, I've also just heard of this. I don't frequent my GW store, to be fair. But I think the idea is every month there's a model of the month. And if you go into a GW store, you can. Oh, you can do you know one. what? I've no, I've never had one, mm -hmm. but it's like a I feel like screen. I have heard about this, but don't. I feel like I heard like I think you have to paint them in there. You have to paint it in there, or you have to build it in there at least, or something. I think the like idea that. of it is to get new people into painting, but I think if you're like, you know, friendly with the people in there, I think maybe they just be like, "Here you go, is the yeah. free one." Yeah. yeah, I heard of it. I haven't ever had one, so I don't really go to my local store that much. But um, but yeah, no, I have heard of it. But it is right, like. Um, they are right completely. You can use that as a as like a new palette every single month to paint something a bit different than what you'd normally do, um, which is quite good. Yeah, but, yeah. I see him post about it, but I've never like actually bothered to think to myself, wonder what what deal is there. Yeah, so go, go and get a free model. Just go and ask. Go and see what's it. up. Yeah, our oh, man on the ground, do some recon. Yeah, I'll go. I'll, what I'll do, I'll go and test. Yeah, I'll go and see what happens. I'll just burst into GW and ask. <laughs> free model please you've got, to, you've got to do like the recap of it like a true weather reporter like, yeah and then you know, I'll, I'm outside I'll let you know next my local week. GW and I've just picked up <laughs> <laughs> it's I'll raining let, and it's I'll let, I'll let you know how it goes next week but the, the rest of the comment it was a lot more informal if you want to talk about that a little bit uh, yeah I think the practice thing like is is important as we said on that episode yeah um, 100% I, I don't like the procrastination of watching tutorials and stuff I get where it comes from and it's obviously great to learn but yeah. I think you've got to have a bit of a conversation with yourself at a certain point and be like okay I should actually probably, probably paint some stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just collecting all these free models <laughs> uh, Gibbon Deluxe 4 says I just had a watch of the Warlords Wargaming paint stripping video and what I do see on James's desk from more than 10 years ago a Bon Mamom jar sitting right there is this channel just a front for the big jam agenda <laughs> no nope. OG bomber mom baller. That's what, that's what. I, yeah. So, yeah. and what, you know, why did you change over the years? You, you had it. You I had found it something better. Out. I found something better. He brought that to the class, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he 
did. And it was so funny because someone went, oh my God, it's the fishbowl. That was the best, that was the best moment. You also, fishbowl to the class. To the fishbowl to class. Mate. Don't worry, Joe, because all of the Sorry, attendees. Sorry, you brought the candle to the class. Yeah, yeah. 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 Candle, candle glass bowl. Don't worry, because all of the attendees of the course saw it in the flesh and went, yeah, you know what? That is absolutely ridiculous. I actually had one come up to me so. and say, that's actually a really good idea. So they weren't all, they weren't all. Uh, I had someone tell me that we should try and hide little plastic fish in it and see if he'll notice. <laughs> that's quite good. You get <laughs> those stick on ones that you stick, the sticky side and at the bottom and it will look like they're swimming around. Should, no, like get like little, yeah, little plastic like. So you know the ones that come with sushi with the soy sauce in yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this old Warhammer says, I'm shocked that there was a barrel angle discrepancy in the photographs used in the previous episode. Who would have ever expected that we would have a full on barrel gate on our hands? Dodgy photos aside, last week's episode was a gem of a podcast, Tops Notch show yet again this week. These podcasts are pure gold. I have them on in the background at work and occasionally people overhear the episode and get pulled into listening. Uh, and for what it's worth, I too believe in crowning barrels as well, which does make them look better. I also feel that we as a community need to set up a GoFundMe page for George to get a new pin vice. No, he's had enough. We've said this. He's had the shoulder pad, the gift of time. Yeah. He's, had, <laughs> he's had the refreshers. Yeah. He, does, he can get his own... That's you know, a significant investment yeah, for the if community. He's, if, you, if he's making the argument of this amazing pin vice that he's got, then... That's on, that's on George. It was a Tamiya pin vice that I lost, by the way. That's a, that's a, I still don't understand how you lost it. You, hang on a second. That was a Tamiya pin vice. Yeah. But they're like, they're like a great company that make good stuff. Yeah, I lost it. So no, not the one he was it. using. The one he lost. Oh, the one you lost? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah okay. That's why I had the, the crappy one from Amazon that would come next day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say, if it was a Tamiya one that, that, yeah, that I beat, then I was, uh, I'll take even more cute off. No no, 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 no. Unfortunately not. But... Again, I'm glad that obviously the viewers enjoyed the the drill off episode. The integrity of it was shattered a little bit with dodgy <laughs> photos. Yeah, I have to agree. There was a um, lot of um, there was a lot of pr pr producer based bias. You won. Yeah, what uh, are you talking about? I know. You, the thing is, no, that it, producer based bias won you the competition. No, it didn't. If it had it's been like, fair, no, no, I would have no, won. No, 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 no. You wouldn't. Not. No, no, you wouldn't. No, let's 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 get that Stop right. Stop undermining the judge's final say. <laughs> yeah, OG authenticator. Don't. Um, yeah, I mean, it had, it, you know, it was promising. It had had the chance to be a very good uh, competition, but some people don't take it seriously as others I know. make a joke of it. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't understand how you can sit I don't there. understand how people are expecting the sport to grow if you're not going to treat it seriously. I saw, some, I, mean? I saw some comments about having like underground barrel drilling competitions in like yeah. underground car parks. Someone said like, oh, like VAR's going to ruin barrel yeah, drilling yeah. or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Which you could argue, argue it already did. With those images, yeah. Um, so again, but I'm glad. I'm glad the person that commented did agree that boring out the barrel makes it look better because I, I, I've I've always been a firm believer. Was that in this comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm a firm believer in the in the boring out barrels. So, so yeah. I again, I I did think it looked good as well until you know the iffy, AR iffy pictures. Yeah. But what's well, so how you feel about this in the rematch, Joe? What's we'll how yeah. you feel when you're on the chopping block? Yeah. Well, I think. Well, I'm not going to bore about. Well, we should call it G, G A R, not V A R. Why is it G-A-R? It's George A, whatever the A in the R stands for. It's George. <laughs> <laughs> George A. Did oh. you think, sorry, do you think that A and V-A-R stood for A? I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying it should be G-A-R for George and then whatever the A and the R stands for is added on to George. I think it's a uh, assistant referee. It's virtual assistant referee. Yeah. So really. So George he, assistant referee. Yeah. Doesn't really work. Yeah. Doesn't really work. I love the commitment. Especially as he didn't assist anything. I know, he ruined, ruined it for himself, yeah. <laughs> I love the commitment of that. He was like, he was like yeah, we we'll do J.I. So George... Uh, <laughs> George uh, A. A. <laughs> whatever, whatever it stands for, yeah. Blue Capgun 785 says, the general attitude you guys have on painting reminds me very much of my own perspectives on food preparation. I'm a young chef and the amount of shortcuts, life hacks and gadget that are in home kitchens is insane especially when you consider that a skilled hand with a knife, a pot and a pan could do all of that work. Practice your fundamentals always. Well, I tell you, if you liked the last episode, you're going to love the uh, the spud shop episodes because there'll be some some potatoes flowing by the sound team. So <laughs> yeah, you'll either love or hate that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. Where maybe maybe we should get his advice on the best potatoes to use for said competition. Yeah, true. That could. That could we're going to have P A R potato assistant. Potato <laughs> A, whatever it stands for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do like that comparison though. Um, I never really thought about it when they're in the scope of other 
I, don't, I, could, I wouldn't call cooking a hobby as such, but I guess it is for some people. But regardless, yeah. like the gadgets and stuff uh, around it. Yeah, George just insulted <clears throat> every single chef in one fell it's, prof- it's a profession. It's not, no, he's not insulting him. He's saying it's not a hobby, is it? It's like a, It is a hobby, I suppose, yeah. It's yeah. a hobby in as much as anything else is. is I, I guess suppose. I paint plastic toys for a living, so I can't really yeah, come exactly, after people's yeah. hobbies. <laughs> yeah, it's the only thing we all need to live, George. I mean, <laughs> As artists, we know how time-consuming painting miniatures is, especially if you want to achieve a high standard for tabletop or display. Life is busy, and we don't all have eight hours a day to paint. Plus, if you're still early in your painting journey, it may feel that you're a long way off ever owning your own beautiful army for your games. For 10 years, Siege Studios has been delivering bespoke miniature painting commissions to collectors and gamers all over the world. We have a world-class team of artists from Golden Demon winners to ex-studio painters, collating hundreds of years of collective experience. Here at Siege, we offer a series of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a favorite character for your display or a stunning gaming army. We pride ourselves on offering well above the industry standard of quality and our customer experience. To see our gallery, learn more about our services and get a quote now, head over to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. Topic this week, what we really think of Vallejo. Now, we've done this episode uh, style previously with the Army Painter. We spoke about the Fanatic range of paints, and we had some requests to do some other brands. So uh, this is one that we have quite a lot of experience with, very, very popular in the miniature painting hobby, outside of Citadel and uh, Army Painter, of course. And uh, I think for this one, we're going to do it as more of like an overview of the brand as a whole because they do loads and loads of different stuff which we'll get into and, and also because testing the whole entire range would have taken probably about six decades so so yeah there's quite a lot of paints yeah there. and other products like like george is saying i also think with the army painter one that was specifically we were being asked to, to review, review the yeah. paint range specifically whereas obviously army painter do other products as well mm-hmm. but that wasn't the topic for that video but yeah yeah as a whole i think uh, an overview is probably the best way to go for this one yeah um i mean it's definitely a popular brand i think the help with that is i guess they're more there's more overlap with this brand than any other i can think of with like the broader model making scale modeling community as such if that makes sense um because i know a lot of like airbrush painters and a lot of scale model painters use the vallejo model color range Mm. um whereas army painter is specifically targeted at miniature painting so is citadel and so on um, so can you, I can't really think of many other brands that have as much overlap and therefore a broad appeal. And I guess the upside of this is that this is like probably one of the most accessible and available paints like to buy in stores, I would say, probably yeah. globally. I, I think so, yeah, because it, it not only obviously is, in, is involved heavily in outside of the miniatures industry, but like where it originates from and where more people are probably aware of it from is probably like more scale modeling. So like you, even as a kid going down most hobby shops, I remember, again, this is an old one for anyone that remembers it. There used to be a shop called Beatties. I don't know if anyone remembers that shop. but Surprisingly, Beatties, no. <laughs> it's a great hobby shop. I used to, there were all the planes on the ceiling. It used to be amazing. Um, was it like a proper like, classic it like, was air fix type? Care, care fix? Air fix. Care fix, yeah. Uh, proper air fix uh, hobby shop. Um, and even then as a kid, I remember seeing most most notably Tamiya and also Vallejo as the, as the or Vallejo as the two um two brands as george but, usually says yeah so as the as the two two brands which um which really were quite central to scale modeling um the i think for me as a painter it was the first non games workshop paint range that i moved into after citadel so it's the first one that i kind of like started i started seeing that they were that's they, definitely the same for me as well yeah. I don't know about you i think it actually wasn't for me because it was the army painter, Mm -hmm. but it was definitely the first one that I heard about in, within the conversation, the context of it being like, Oh, it's like what the pros use. And like the, the connotation that it's like a step up or something, which we'll get into why we've already explained previously on episodes, why one paint range is never really better than another and things like that. But the, the perception at that, when you first hear about it was like, Oh, it's like what the, yeah. competition entries are done with like all this stuff um so i did I, I was a bit intimidated by it personally which maybe we'll get into so i oh, never really. really bought many of them when i started painting um do you know what got me to pick them up actually funny this is a bit of a tangent but during the pandemic that was not long after i'd started painting and it was impossible to get citadel paints online basically or like certainly fast mm. um whereas because the vallejo stuff is available like 
Amazon and like everywhere else. That was when I was running out of paint and I needed new colors and stuff. That was the easiest avenue to go down. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. I mean, the wide distribution, the fact they've been around for, for decades and, and like it, it's surprising that it actually took so long for it to have a bit of a rise in the wargaming and, and war, like Warhammer side of the industry. I think it's, it, you know. Is it only a recent thing then? Because I know you've been in the hobby not, for longer than us. It's but. not recent. I mean, like I, I, <laughs> Vallejo was making quite, quite significant, like, uh, saturation within the industry, even when I started or got back into it after I came back and stopped, stopped in music. So I, I, I picked up some Vallejos pretty quickly once I got back into it, um, just through seeing people using them online or, or even just in passing conversation in like groups and stuff like that, seeing people talk about them. So before sort of like 2013, I, I'm not too sure when they made, started making such a huge impact in the industry, but I know that they've been around quite, quite prominent since about 2013 onwards i mean even when i first got back into it as i mentioned um so yeah i think i didn't even pick any up until i worked here i think i literally i maybe like asked to borrow it's got to be 950 surely no it wasn't 950 <laughs> even i think i asked to borrow a paint um like a citadel one we didn't have it but oh. you were like I'll try oh, this. you should just try this. And it yeah. was like a brown Vallejo like to do level with. Oh, okay. It yeah, was yeah. like, I spoke about it before. It was like, uh, I forgot the name again, but it was like Flat Earth or something like yeah. that. Not Flat Earth. Can't be Flat Earth. Unless that's a pun name. Well, I'll, I'll <laughs> use, I don't we'll, think we'll it get onto names flat in a minute. Brown or something yeah. like that or, or, or Brown Earth could, or something, something, something like that. Yeah. I'm not a Flat Earth. Just to throw that out. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah. And then I, it's a brilliant paint specifically. It was a model color one. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I so remember that was the moment for me where I was like, Oh, I should delve a little bit further into this. Cause this is really nice paint to use kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of how the earth is flat, I think that's going to bring me to my first point on the list of, uh, in the like pros and cons column of the brand as a whole. Um, my, <laughs> I understand why people don't like the like really specific, like nerdy paint names that some of the miniature paints have for the Warhammer stuff, mm. which one, I understand why they do that for like trademarking and all that sort of stuff. That makes sense. And then also I get why people find it like a, a bit cringe. It's also like thematic, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I understand why some people don't want to paint their Sherman tank in Nurgling. some goblin color or whatever. Yeah. Like fair play. But I would say that Vallejo is on the other end of the spectrum completely to the point of their names are so unbelievably useless that it's a detriment to their paint range. And I say that as a victim of the pale blue gray, pale gray blue uh, I've, I've dilemma had, I've had yeah. that. that tripped me I've, up I've had that, many yeah. times. Yeah. There are so many of their paints, and they're just called what they are, which is nice. It's helpful. But when they have multiple paints with basically the same name and they're unbelievably generic, and I have to resort to a five digit decimal code system. It's very frustrating. I mean, I, I actually find writing down the decimal code in like my journal and stuff ten times easier than actually writing down the long name. I mean, like I'm not. It's being, not glanceable not, information. Not, though, yeah, but I know. Yeah. But I'm not being funny. You're I'm not, not, I'm not going through your thing and going, oh, six, seven, of, five. I know. Well, I know that's. Uh, no, I know. I get that. But like sometimes it is harder to write down like Panzerfaust firing pin shadow color blue. Like it's. Just yeah, but like, I also think that's <laughs> a terrible <laughs> name for a page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, but like it's just like. I, I get what you're saying about those. Some of them, some of them, but then you say that, but then look at how we compared, obviously the black, the black paints from the army paints to the, to the uh, uh, Vallejo one. Uh, whereas it's matte black, but then the 950 is just called black. <laughs> like, yeah. you know I mean? yeah, so but if you I, can't get more, more factually correct about the paint than that, it's black. Yeah, black, <laughs> that right. one's fine. Black makes sense. Cause it's just, it's, it's just black. black. Yeah. It's black. That's fine. But when you've got like pale gray and Gray, pale. Yeah, but yeah. it's like blue, just, gray, you, gray, When blue. you've got literally the same words in a different order. Do you know what? A step further is with Vallejo. Obviously, have different ranges of paint. Yeah, within a lot. their their entire range. I don't know what the sub brands, sub ranges. Yeah, um, I think they don't even know how many. <laughs> yeah, <they have laughs> so, they, so it's like model color, game color, uh, model air, yeah. game, game air, air, mecha, mecha. mecha. Metal um, color, metal color <laughs> within. Uh, Isn't model... metal color within VMC? No, I actually no, don't no, know. No, I actually don't no. know. No. So metal color is its own thing. Then what I was about to say was, within model color, certain colors are labeled as metallics, and same, obviously, uh, and same, and maybe they're not specifically actually within metallics. It's within the model air 
within model air some of them are like, <laughs> some of them are metallics so like it get it gets Thanks confused, for clearing but, up, they're not, but they're not but they're not metal color they're still are you following air. this i'm lost i'm so, I'm so, so lost. lost four it's hours not, later it's not, it's not my fault it's your point <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is like, I understand why a lot of the Vallejo paints have the names they do, because again, starting in the, in the arena of painting, they, 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 they mainly were involved, obviously more historicals. If you want like a uh, uniform, like German uniform gray or like British uniform, like all those different colors, having the paint labeled that color makes perfect sense. If you're painting those. That's infantry. a bit more descriptive. No, I though. get that. I get that. But <sighs> that's not as bad. I find it more problematic when it's like just generic color names that are basically the same as another one of their generic color names that is yeah. may or may not be the from the same gray, paint I, range. I, I too fell victim to the pale blue gray, uh, pale gray blue uh, scenario because I was I was edge highlighting some black and I need those colors. But then, yeah, I, I, I ordered the wrong pot. And I, I've been there as well and I understand completely what you mean. But I don't know. I, I like the use of the serial number because um, I remember them more by the serial number and appropriate the color to the number like we shortened 70.950 to just 950 black. So I, 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 I do prefer the- That's the only one though. Yeah, but I, I, do, I do prefer having that, that numbering system to just remembering all these- I, I think like, it's helpful, but I think that you can have both of those. I think you can have a, a memorable, useful name that is different to all of the other paints in the range and yeah. have a number system and get it right. Yeah, I true. think Army Painter nailed it with the- the fact of they've got like thematic paint names, but then on the side of the bottle, it tells you like just the, the generic thing. Yeah. Oh, this is a purplish blue. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I do agree. I guess let's talk about like the paints specifically then. Um, what's your just sort of general opinion of like, if someone said like, oh, I'm, I use Vallejo paints. Is that like a good thing? Yeah, bad thing? I, I think so. Yeah. They're really high performing. I, 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 I have had very minimal amounts of time where I've bought a new one and I've not found it either mid range in, in its performance and its ability and what you can do with it. I think there's very few paints. The only ones which I personally don't really like it are the, like the fluoro. I don't really use them very much at all. And, and when I say don't like, that's a bit of an over overkill. I don't, that's still a tiny, that's, it's that's a tiny what, percentage like on the, on the, 10 on the colors or something, yeah. but even within their ranges of paint. Um, and I just want to just, finish, I, 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 I the fluoro is just not that they're bad. It's just I don't really use them very much and I haven't really ever needed to. So I, I think they're a bit it, of a, a fringe paint as well. Yeah. They're kind of a specialty yeah. thing. But, but 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 within their ranges, I they've all, they're known as a premium paint range as well. That's the thing. Like and I think you've got to take into account the fact they've been around for such a long time. They've got the experience, the chemical, the chem chemistry side for as long as they have been making paint. So they should be at that point where they're making consistently good paints as they increase, expand, add, and 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 revitalize ranges. Um I've mainly used the model color, which I absolutely love the, the model color range. So I, I predominantly use model color um, and the model air. They're the two that I tend to use. Um, I think, it could correct me if I'm wrong, and anyone who's watching this who wants to correct me in the comments because I don't know the full in-depth details of the range or the brand. But as far as I'm aware, there are different sets of colors and tones within the different game air and uh, model air and also with the the other the other ranges as well i've just i've i've found that the model color range typically has a lot more paints that are suited to the scale model inside and i think it's i think correct me if i'm wrong again i think it's the longest running version or brand within vallejo if memory serves i think right. yeah i mean that would make i've always had the assumption that game color was brought out as a and game air was brought out as a thing to accept war gaming and stuff like that. Potentially, so gaming a little bit more. Potentially, yeah. Do you think the that other... there's it's at the point now though where there's so many ranges as we've explained that that makes it more difficult for a new painter to like, understand what like, where to start? If that makes sense. Yeah, because I mean, one of the main things I was going to get to when I was listing those different brands or ranges or whatever was that. Within those brands, the there's colors that have the same name but are different colors. Yeah. So you can't just say Vallejo pale gray like you were saying or pale blue gray because model color will have a pale blue gray 
game color might have a pale blue gray yeah and they have completely different colors it's to not even just that the properties of the paint are different well, this it's, is, it's this literally is, a different color yeah it's literally yeah. a different color there's also for example um a color called gunmetal which is the uh, model air metallic yep. thing that a lot of people love to use mm-hmm. um but there's also a game color, I think, gunmetal or a model, just a normal mo- model, which is just like a dark gray type color. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, that sort of side of it does get a bit confusing. I've had that before, where I, I, I really like a color that's called white gray, so it's like a desaturated white. Um, and I use is that. it a grayish white by any chance? It's a grayish white. You are most most certainly correct. Um, I like using that for like uh, wings and stuff on my bell angels and things. And I, I prefer the air version to the, uh, to the model color version. Cause obviously model color has a, in my mind and from experience of using them, it has a much denser pigment concentration. I find them more akin to the games workshop base paints, putting that on a, on a, on a model really thin layers to build up a, a, a really smooth white. I find the model color is a lot harder to do because it has so much pigment in it and involves way less you have to be a lot more careful with it because it can build up texture quickly if you're not careful because of the amount of pigment that's in it whereas the air white gray it goes on lovely and smooth especially when like you hair dry it and stuff just to fix it in place um and i made the mistake again of ordering one online and totally the, the two paints they they're pretty much exactly the same color as in hue but um but the difference in their behavior and the way they are is, is like massive um I can't think of any other brand where people interchange airbrush paints for regular brush painting as much as the Vallejo stuff. I can't think of anyone, I'm sure they do, but I can't think of anyone saying, oh yeah, I use the Citadel Air for this all the time. Like that's such a normal common thing with the Vallejo stuff. But I think they've got the sweet spot of perfect uh, opacity and also viscosity as in how they move when you put when you move them on the palette or on the mer- maybe mixture. it's just me then because i've tried a few of the airbrush paints for like just normal brush painting and i've found them way too thin and unpredictable personally i think it's probably done more outside of vallejo before the sort of invention of contrast paints and that style of paint because mm. i think people used to potentially use pre-thinned airbrush paints as like a wash or use it to I don't just mean that though. Like I'm talking about like just base coat. And I know people use the airbrush metallics all the time but with, with, brush yeah, that's paint. the yeah. only one really that I use as a yeah. thing. Um, I mean the coverage is just great. So yeah. it's like, I yeah, no other air brand within another paint again, brand again, really it, does that. I think with the brush, do you find that you have to, if you was actually to airbrush it, you'd have to thin it more though. I haven't tried. It I literally haven't tried to put that, metallic because to me uh, an airbrush paint should be straight out of the bottle straight into the paint cup otherwise what's the point in being an airbrush paint you can't mm. you can't say that just due to due to the differences in behavior from paint to paint to paint that, like the thing is is you're quite right in theory that should be how it works but i've had it before where i've used like in the uh, magic blue through the airbrush which is an air, uh, a Vallejo game air color um and it it i find it sometimes it's a bit thick mm. but, so i've had to put in a, a drop of thinner or fly improver, or whatever you use, uh, to to get it to to go right through the airbrush. So I think it does vary on those paints. The metallics, you're quite right in the way that they go on with a brush amazingly, cover amazingly. But then if I was going to use any of the Vallejo metallics, I'd use the metal color ones because they're even better in my mind. Uh, yeah. You know, um, which is another kettle of fish. But but like they're, I do feel like they're thinner. They are, yeah. Even yeah. more yeah. thinner than like if you were going to airbrush metallics then they they the metal color pots would probably be fine they're straight, incredible straight in the airbrush yeah. they are i mean they are they perform amazing like they, yeah. they, they are i mean this sincerely i think they're some of the best metallics for either brush or airbrush usage i think you could quite easily put it on the palette and get it on the model nice and smooth with a brush it, without even hair drying it like i, I genuinely think they're, they're, they're the performance of them is amazing they're one i think they're one the one of the biggest take homes and one of the biggest real strengths of Vallejo as a brand is that they can produce metallics that are that good and behavior. Um, yeah. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2,200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. 
And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Yeah, maybe it's just down to the way I paint, but personally for me, I feel like if you're going to have an airbrush range and a normal paint range, the airbrush ones should be ready to airbrush without thinning. Otherwise, I might as well just thinned down one of your regular paints for the range, if that makes sense. No, like, I, I might have to thin it less, but the fact that I'm even having to thin it at all is Yeah, I think potentially as well, though, what James is saying about how the normal model colour paints are so highly pigmented. Mm. Like Some of them are quite thick, aren't they? Mm. And it's like, that's great in certain situations for using a brush. But obviously, if you did want to thin that down for an airbrush, it's quite... It can nine, be nine, quite a lot. Like. Nine, nine five zero is a prime example. Like it, it's as we all know, it's amazing for 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 painting black and covering things, and obviously with with that color, you try and glaze with it. You have to use the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest amount because it's got so it much stains in it. a lot. Yeah, yeah. It stain yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah, and and the same with the airbrush. Like, like I I when I ran out of rattle can, uh, chaos black or color forge black or whatever, um, I've airbrush undercoated with nine five zero, and it needs and you, I've diluted it down through the airbrush, and you you seriously have to thin it because it just it literally is so strong, um, and that's as you quite rightly said, it's very common about the model color range. Well, I guess within that, then um, they obviously have their other ranges of products outside of I guess paints specifically, mm -hmm. and off the back of what you said about priming and such, uh, we've spoken on a few episodes now about the airbrush primer mm -hmm. and our I guess misgivings with uh with using that yeah um, i mean well i've never really had much trouble with it though still like i, I, I like you like it yeah everyone awesome. everyone does seem didn't to you agree about though it. that it doesn't stick well and you said that that's I, why you like it so you could strip your model it's easier <laughs> just calling you out there live on the podcast joe you're so like, you basically admit you're no. like oh yeah it's terrible but that helps me <laughs> no i think I mean, it is easier. To, it, obviously, it doesn't stick as well because it's not got whatever the chemicals that are being put into the aerosol can. I don't know that it's a specific... There is obviously a difference between the aerosol stuff in the way that the paint behaves, but I've used other airbrush primers from other brands that have not been as difficult to work with. I've never used any others. I I, and I, again, I wouldn't say it was difficult to work with. Like, it, I didn't have any... It doesn't stick as a primer. I didn't, <laughs> it doesn't I didn't, stick. I didn't have any issues where it just the like, whole point wasn't of a primer. sticking. Like, where it wasn't sticking. You I, said you stripped the model off and it came off... You yeah, said you, yeah, but you I said, stripped it. No, like, that's me no, stripping you the model. Said, sorry, I'm not stripping sorry, the Joe, model. George wants a primer that you throw... Uh, I'm not, you throw a stripping agent at it. You said you scraped it off with your thumb. I'm not stripping the model and then going, oh, look at that, what a load of rubbish. All the paint's come off. You said... It's ridiculous. You said, oh, I didn't even really have to strip it. I just rubbed it off. Well, yeah, after, like, straight after and I'd done it. And you're calling that a good primer. Straight yeah. after yeah. I'd done it. I, I, I feel I, like you think I'm, like, way higher up on, on this airbrush primer than I am. Like, I, I had a little dabble. I, I had a dabble with it, and I was using it for a little bit. I, I've used it. It was great when I used it. I then preferred, I, I went through a phase of, when it was, it was when I was doing my own warriors, I was doing, working with a lot of resin, like a lot of Forge World kits. And I just really struggled with it staying on those Forge World kits. So I then switched back to rattle cans. Um, Cause I thought, yeah, this is great. I've got my airbrush booth. I can just prime inside the house or undercoat inside the house. I haven't got to worry about going out in the rain. I've got an extension lead umbrella and hairdryer in the garden doing my models when it's raining or whatever. Thank God you put a stop to that yes, once and for all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily you didn't get hit by lightning, lightning but still. Um, uh, Shame we weren't doing some night lords. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. Um, but, but then after using it on those models that I, that I was, uh, that I was doing for my own warriors, like I, I just, I had those problems. So I went back to a, a spray can or rattle cans and I just haven't ever gone back to it. So maybe I need, need maybe I do need to revisit it and see obviously if it's, if I, I just think if you're not like, maybe there's a reason why if it is being used, it's often, I don't think people who are like gaming are using it a lot because mm. it obviously, this, it doesn't stick as well as a spray can, for example. But, I think that would be more that like what are the other 
primers that you're mentioning that you've used spray primers? Um, I've tried the AK one, which I thought was a lot better. And I'm trying to think, I think it was from an airbrush. It might have been like a Badger one or something like, you know, one of the airbrush brands. One of the actual airbrush yeah, brands, um, yeah. And that was, that was fine. I've not used it a lot, though. Yeah, weird. I mean... I've got more, ex it, to be fair though, I've got way more experience with using the Vallejo one. So I guess that there is kind of a selection bias going on there because I've used it more yeah. and therefore I've had more problems with it. But, you know. Yeah. Um, I think it's a pretty small selection of their overall. Well, they do, they, offer, they, they do them in quite a few different colors, the surface primer colors. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, you know, they have loads know. of airbrush paints. Uh, sorry, not, they have loads of airbrush products as well, like kind of in that family. Like I love the thinner that they have. They have the flow improver. I was going to talk cleaner. about those because I, I, I'm quite, I'm quite interested in those two because I always get asked, oh, like, what's the difference? And I had to do a lot of due diligence and research into this because I'm hand on heart. I've always used just the thinner. I've not used flow improver that much at all whatsoever because I just thought oh, it's some newfangled product that's got the word improve on the label and it's going to make people think that it's going to miraculously stop blockages and stuff like that. Um, and I've, I've, I have tried it, um, and I have used it and I've still had blockages and stuff with it uh, using it, but I actually looked into some of the, some of the reviews of it. I had looked into the actual product listing. I had to look into things and really what it boils down to is that it's more like a medium or like a anti drying retarder basically so that it, it makes the, the paint not diluted, but it just makes it more viscous and adds body to it. If that makes sense. Um, whilst obviously drying less quickly, that's what flow improver essentially is. So it does dilute because it, it does kind of dilute because it increases the viscosity of the paint, but it kind of like, it will take longer for it to dry on the surface of the model from what I've looked into and read. Whereas the thinner obviously harshly thins down the paint, but it actually dries because it evaporates very, very quickly on the model. So they're kind of like two different animals completely. And I think there is a lot of, I've, I've been asked on classes before, and this is what made me do a lot of like, research into it because i was like what actually is the difference between the two and what is the benefit of each one and i'd be actually interested in whether you can put that on a palette as in like the foam prover into paint on a palette oh you, you can you definitely yeah. can yeah. i've never i've not used it in that way so it's yeah. something i want to experiment i've done it a little with. bit with um for like glazing and stuff yeah um I mean, it definitely works it's just a medium yeah in, in my experience but. yeah but i think there's a lot of thought that it is like it's a which which can be you in for for thinning paint is it the, is it the thinner or is it the foam prover? i think they're different different tools with different jobs. I don't think, I think if you're going to thin paint, use the thinner. And if you're going to, if you want the paint to last longer while you're using it, then then maybe use the flow improver. One of the, one of the biggest misconceptions I hear a lot is people thinking of the thinner as if it's going to like chemically break down the paint and therefore it's acceptable to use as a cleaner. Cause I think people think of it as like paint thinner in the same sense of like paint stripper kind of thing. Um, they're not, they're different products. Um, I've, told this to many people and uh if you're having problems with like blockages and cleaning out your airbrush and stuff give the cleaner a go because it will actually properly clean your airbrush yeah i think they're they're cleaner and they're thinner is my like go-to airbrush yeah it is yeah for me yeah, as well on. i get through bottles and bottles of that stuff well i do especially considering i don't dilute it apparently yeah so, that's a whole so, other conversation so, that we've had yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, but uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's it is interesting. I, I've I've accidentally thinned paint before with a cleaner. I have, and I I didn't actually realise until after I'd done it. So that's a little bit of a schoolboy. But you you still can use. it I think to it's, do that. it can still work. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying in the long it term. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm saying in the in the long term, if you're not using any cleaner and you're using the same thinner that you thin paint with yeah. as a cleaner for your airbrush, you're not going to necessarily have great results over time. No, because the cleaner has got the extra lubrication in it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to pull it around quickly back to the uh, the normal like model color range because I came in a bit a bit hot and heavy, a bit gung ho in the, the beginning of this. I actually think that the model color range are some of the most consistent, reliable, like I could just buy one off the shelf and I know it'd be fine paints like across the board. I think that's just one of the most consistent paint ranges from color to color. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had a problem with like using a model color paint. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think I've ever gone to use one and gone, oh, it's like not covering. Oh, it's so well, runny. Like, oh, it's separate. Yeah, like, yeah, it just doesn't happen. Uh, yeah, I think it's yeah, it's fairly consistent, like you say. Yeah, I've I've always found their paints very very good, and and I think in the instances where maybe there has been a pot that's maybe a bit satin or something like that, I think it's just it's just needed a good mix, and it's gone back to how it needs to needs to behave. I also like, think actually, I don't know whether I'm thinking of specifically model color or across the others or whatever, but the only paints I can ever really remember having an issue with are like typical paints or typical colors that you'd have issues with pretty much anywhere so like yellows and some reds and stuff like that like 
not always they're not always super reliable colors in any range are yeah. they really it's one of the reasons why we always talk about citadel's reds being so good because they just are yeah and like um even citadel's yellows to a certain extent like probably some of the best yellows things like that yeah, i mean i've um, sunset it's amazing yeah you know, but saying so. that i don't have a specific like oh this paint was rubbish no. but i think one of the things that makes them so reliable is that the paint consistency and viscosity is so consistent across the whole range as a whole whereas if you think of like citadel as an example like i love all of their base and layer paints but i couldn't like honestly say that they're all similar to it's each other because some are yeah. so thin and some are a lot thicker and yeah. some of them clump up and some of them separate and I don't really find that with the Vallejo ones. And the fact that they're in a dropper bottle as well makes it like makes pretty easy to rectify. Bit, your yeah. life a bit easier. Yeah. Don't, don't have to transfer. Don't, don't trigger him, please. <laughs> yeah. Had a few uh, members of the uh, the dropper bottle elite uh, on the on the EMC2 course. Oh, so, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Can't, nice. I'll, I'll be honest, not all of them had the correct, uh, Application. The correct dropper bottles that we recommended. So but, now you're you away know. from the class, you can insult their paint bottles. Okay, yeah, Josh, like, yeah. Honestly, it didn't have the heart to oh, say it to their honest, faces. I said it to my face and I brought mine in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any other products uh, within the Vallejo range that you want to on a, give honorable throw, mention? For a couple out, actually. I've mentioned before my famous single hobby hack that I've done. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke about sort of texture paint and Vallejo do like Massive pots the big of tubs, it. Aren't yeah, they? big tubs of it. Um, I feel like there's literally no reason to use anything else if you're going to use texture paint. Like the value for what you get is insane. If you're going to use texture paint, they're solid, like all different colors and things. If you can't be bothered to paint it after, um, but the other one, which I don't think I've actually ever mentioned on air, when James was going through his Tamiya sanding sponge. Um, epiphany epiphany I'd call it less of an epiphany and more of like some sort of cultish obsession obsession yeah, yeah. Um, I'm past those I, days I did get some and I do like them I think they're, they're good for certain uses but an issue that I found with them was that they're like very soft like it's hard to tough, like yeah. get any which is good and also bad it's a bit flimsy yeah so it's like but it's only good, good, it's good if you've got something really really fine detail because if you had something that was firm you wouldn't be able to yeah, use it or you potentially need to like curve a surface yeah. or something like that yeah but um it's not the best all rounder so what i actually looked to was vallejo's Vallejo's own version. They do like oh, some do they, sand, do they do some sanding pads. Oh, I did not know that they even done that. Which are much more akin to like nail sanding, mm -hmm. like those things. Um and it's a little pack, you get like three pads in. Um, they're different grit on each side, mm -hmm. effectively. So you get six, a selection of six different grits. Different grits. Um uh it's them. The green ones. Yeah. Um and they're way firmer. Not it's not like literally having like a block of wood or something. Like it's not like <laughs> that, which is good. It's still there's still a little bit of give there. But like they they're just way firmer, way easier to use for me. And I, I just sort of prefer not like cutting a little bit off and using a little bit. Do you know what I mean? I like to actually just hold th the thing and, and Do you know it's, that's a good thing though, because if you need just like a tiny little bit, you can just cut off like a tiny How little bit. How am I holding off? a tiny little bit? Like I'm sitting there like with this tiny little Flimsy Twe bit of sanding sponge. Tweezers. Like. No, I don't. But it, it can't be that small that you need tweezers. How are you going to sand something with tweezers? This is before you. This is what you're agreeing with. I'm not agreeing you're with You're agreeing with him. That's what you're agreeing with. I'm not agreeing with, with him. I'm so saying that's insane. With, that's your people. <laughs> that's when it comes your to, people. <laughs> that's your people when it comes to sanding it. sponge. I've used I'm it saying before. The, the Vallejo ones are like just a good solid block. You can just use the corner, whatever. If it corner gets super worn down, then yeah, you can probably cut it and. And you've got a fresh. I think. I think the reason why the Tammy ones are so good is that, like, because they are soft. If you are a bit heavy-handed with them, you won't snap things off. I think the firmer the actual object you're doing the abrasion with, the more chance of damage to the object you're trying to soften. It's a pet. Uh, again, I've had some spindly. I've had some spindly bits puncture the sandpaper and get stuck in the sponge and then torn them off. So I'm going to humbly disagree don't, with don't, that. And don't that's how wrong. you don't use the Tammy at sanding. Don't get me wrong. I'm not using these sanding pads for anything like that. Like, yeah, yeah. It's more just like bigger areas or just flat panels. It might be good to just like use, the, use the Vallejo ones first and then use the Tamiya ones afterwards. I wouldn't, like I wouldn't whip out one yeah. of the Tamiya ones for like building a rhino. 
like for a big so I mean, yeah, I don't yeah, I use yeah, it. No, I, I, really cool to say, yeah. I just don't like yeah holding like a little flimsy bit of sand and sponge like yeah what you know what am I doing so <laughs> these are these don't are like very the, good, the precision very, very good uh, very good product I All would right. say James yeah. got any honourable mentions yeah so close I, out I so in preparation for the episode I obviously just I wanted to go and like refresh myself with like Blake as a company and like obviously I'm familiar with the paint ranges and that kind of stuff. I was actually really surprised that they do like they do a lot of stencils for airbrushing. They do scenic stuff as well. They actually do scenery. So there's there's quite a few things that like I wasn't even aware that they did as a business. I think it's pretty safe bet to say they do literally everything. Like if you wanted to only use Vallejo, you, you they'd could have covered. Yeah, 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 you could. Like they, yeah, they do, do brushes. They do like, tools. They do everything. Well. Yeah, they, they do, do brushes. Yeah, yeah they, they do. And they do, do they do tools as well. They so, do like, tools, yeah. brushes, every literally everything. Like. There is a version of it that's Vallejo. I think that's kind of to my point with the paint range. If like, there's just so much stuff, I it's find it difficult it. to navigate. Yeah, it's just everything. to the degree of I didn't even know that they did brushes because they do so much stuff. It's they they have an insane like broad range, and that is either a positive or a negative, depending on who you're asking, I suppose, and what your current situation is, yeah. and what you're looking for in that moment. Like, and I guess what's available to you locally. Yeah, to a degree. But. Yeah, I mean we have. We have like fairly big shops near us anyway yeah, yeah. that stock all the big brands regardless. So I can't say I've ever found myself in a situation where I'm like, oh, I can't find Vallejo. I mean, they've got like, it'd be fairly easy for us to go and buy a green stuff world paint if we wanted. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've never really had been in that situation. Um, but I assume, yeah, Vallejo is probably one of the more readily available up there with Citadel. Probably depends where you are in the world as well, yeah. I imagine, yeah. to a degree. Yeah. We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about, and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day, all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios question of the week time thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week if you have a question that you'd like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast please leave it in the comments down below if you're watching on youtube or if you are listening to this episode on any of the audio platforms uh, your favorite podcast app of choice then please fire us a dm on instagram at siege studios this week we have a question from ashar three who says love the content lads really enjoyable and would the Bosch driller compare to a DeWalt sniper in a power tool off? Seriously though, how can you tell when you've moved past the beginner's stage of painting? I've always struggled to know what level I'm at. In my mind, I'm still a beginner, but others have said I'm nowhere near that level. What would you call a threshold you know when you're at a higher standard? I have a bit of a different view on this. Mm -hmm might not be the best person to, to ask straight up the, for the first answer. But I think I started to think about what I would like, how I would answer that or how I would consider that. And I think all I could lean on was like, all I could land on was to like, does it matter? Like, does it ma actually matter? Like, I don't think, I, I don't think you need to define whether you're still a beginner or not, or I completely agree. I'm glad you said like that. It's like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I think the reason it's difficult is because it doesn't matter yeah. like the, the, and it's different for everyone. So it depends really, I think, on what what are the reasons you want to pigeonhole yourself as to where you're at or something. Yeah. I, 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 the thing with beginner and more advanced or more experienced, that, that, it, that is it, literally what it boils down to is experience. Like you could be a beginner for half an hour. Like I've had classes where we sit someone down with an airbrush and some water and ink in it. They, they play with the airbrush for, 15, 20 minutes and how to use a trigger, the distance from the object, et cetera, blah, blah. And then after that period of time, they're no longer a beginner. They're actually experienced with using it. So 
what actually quantifies as a beginner what the quality of your execution how well you know techniques how well you know how to apply paint how to dilute paint what what quantifies it's going to differ for everyone as well yeah, it's not yeah. an objective yeah. like truth is, is, it? is, is it a time based 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 thing is it like i've been painting for a year so i'm a beginner like you know we're reviewing some models on critique clinic and like someone said they've been painting for a year but their model was really really well painted and everything was like sectioned nicely looked smooth looked good so is that person a beginner because they've been painting a year or is, are they not a beginner because their models are smooth and consistent like what just to I, try and like pick apart maybe from where this question comes from because I, I, to be fair this could just come from a completely harmless place the only thing i'm thinking in terms of drawing from my own experience is perhaps some apprehension about trying some techniques that are like maybe supposed to be like for more experienced painters, if that makes sense. Um, maybe that's maybe why they're trying to establish, like, oh, am I ready to try this technique or not? But I'd probably make the argument of just give it a go. Just always anyway. try any of yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Like it doesn't matter if you've been painting for two weeks, if you look at NMM and go, oh, I want to give that a go. Just try it. Like, is yeah. It, I, yeah. It's, it is a fear that stops people. I don't think it's a... Um, it's like we all do it, I suppose, about different things, and we are we are sort of. I think maybe when you just start something, you like to maybe say, if you're if you're learning it, learning it something, you'll be like, oh, I'm I'm a complete beginner, like yeah, teach me from scratch, kind of thing. Like so, maybe it starts there, but I, I still think everyone being a complete beginner to something, us three could all start the same new thing tomorrow, and one of us will pick up things quicker than a, than someone else you know what i mean it all depends on your personality and what you're yeah. learning and things like that so it's it's just a bit of a weird yeah situation isn't I it i think i think for all walks of life like seeking validation in a label is probably not the fastest way to to happiness i think it's you know it's just paint and models and you should just yeah. enjoy it it's a hobby i think you know? that really the most important thing is that you enjoy what you do with the, when you're painting miniatures and ultimately you're happy with the results that you have and if you're not happy, that doesn't mean you're a beginner. It doesn't mean you're, you're not exp you're not good. It just means that you're not at a point that the work you produce is to the standard that you would like to produce. So I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't really, I don't really know the moment. There wasn't, there's no, there wasn't a moment in my painting journey so far where I've gone, I'm no longer a beginner. There was just incremental steps of improvement or refinement that got me to a point where I'm starting to go and look at stuff and that I'm doing now and actually go, I'm happy with that. You, know, and I think, you could yeah. get super nitty gritty with this as well. Like for example, like me and yourself, James, we don't do non-metallic metal much. So if we was going to paint an NMM, we'd both like, oh, I'm a beginner to this. Of course it is. But yeah. we both painted thousands of models and I wouldn't necessarily classify myself as a beginner in other respects of painting. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's not to like, not trying to like have a go at the- No, no, by no I, means, no. I, I ask the question or anything like that. I don't want it to come across as too negative. Um, like it's wrong to think like that. No, or, it's not. Or, it's or not. ask that question or whatever. But it's more just like to have some comfort in knowing that it doesn't really, there's no set rules. It doesn't really matter whether you're a beginner or not. Just have fun, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Our closing weekly tradition on this podcast is called Hobby Hacks. This is where we share a little hobby hack with you that hopefully if you're painting while you're listening to this, you might be able to pick up a little technique or two and uh, implement it into your painting. James has got our back yet again because me and Joe have nothing valuable to bring to the table week after As week. As I've said Drier than the Sahara. You... Talk for yourself. I have said previously, <laughs> as has been backed up in the comments, that I like to let my wisdom flow through the episode. And many people have commented agreeing with that. And we had a comment, I think it was a week or two ago, where someone was just like, I've experienced so much wisdom throughout the course of the episode. Yeah. So they get it. And Perfectly sincere comment. was not satirical in no, any wasn't. way, shape or form. <laughs> it wasn't. I don't know why you'd say that. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next, what is this next thing you you've been doing this episode? <laughs> so I'm just testing if it works. Like, can I just move things along if I need to? No. Next. <laughs> no. Anyway, um, yeah. So something that I think frustrates many painters is when you're painting away and you've put some paint into the model, you dry it, and you notice that there's some fibers or something on the on the on the, in the paint or on the model. And it's something that's quite prevalent in a lot of our painting. I still experience it now and again. Uh, I have it with various situations. And I was like trying to find the root cause of like over the last couple of months, I've been really trying to look at my equipment and look at the way I do stuff. Um, and I think it's probably going to be the only the only episode ever where I bash on blitz. So brace yourselves. Um, it's coming out of left field, Joe. Yeah, yeah this is a weird you know, one. Like, I still want that that sponsorship. So like, I just, well, I just it's out uh, the window I now. Know. 
Um, if you if you want the Regina sponsorship, you're gonna have to nip this in the bud now. It's, <laughs> it's, it's it's not gonna be a bash on the product. It's just gonna say that the product is not suited for this task. So yeah. gonna skirt user the, error. I'm gonna skirt that minefield ever so quickly. Um, but no, what I mean by that is, uh, I this is kitchen paper for the international listeners. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so obviously on a palette, uh, when we make a wet palette, we use uh, the, what I tend to use. Obviously, is a homemade one with a, a, a sheet of paper, and then obviously some baking sheet. Um, when I'm working um, on on a wet palette, the, the believe it or not, the, the amount of pressure that you actually apply to the brush on that surface of the wet palette paper, be it a, a one that you've bought that's manufactured or one that you've made for yourself uh, with with baking sheet, I see a lot of painters applying way too much pressure when they're mixing paint or diluting paint with a brush, creating that friction that you can't see, but it's there. That is where a lot of the uh, well, one of the locations where a lot of the a lot of the uh, material and like hairs and fibers and things will be picked up from obviously from that from that wet palette um the other thing as well is obviously when you dry your brush off so um the first it's a double-sided hobby hack this week so the first side of it is should have saved one for next week i could have we start to stacking these yeah uh the no i don't accept i don't accept <laughs> donations <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the first part of it is to just be a bit more gentle with the, with the way you actually move the brush and use the brush on the wet palette that will actually help mitigate the friction that you're causing on that surface believe it or not being more gentle with both the brush on the palette and with the way that you apply paint on the miniature be more gentle and careful with the way you're moving the brush and the, and the friction you're creating the other thing is is obviously when you dry the brush so you you, uh, you rinse the brush to clean it the first thing a lot of people will do is obviously then go to their paper towel that they've folded and draw the brush back to then to then dry that brush. So I've been trying to find something that mitigates friction and stops the brush from collecting fiber of the thing you're rubbing on. So I've actually changed my home painting setup to a kitchen, like a, one of those thin sponges. Um, that, that Like the sheet ones. Like, like the sheet ones, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll wet that sheet as in just just wet it to a so it's a bit damp and then i'll use my use my brush to rinse out all the paint off the thing and then do the drawback on that sponge that's a little bit damp not wet as in like as in saturated because otherwise it's not going to dry the brush at all do that draw back on the on the sponge which will get rid of most of the moisture off of the brush head and also still help you roll the brush into a point or repoint it on there if you don't want to put it in your mouth or whatever and then I've been using a rubber glove a lot more to then just to then just use that to take off some excess as well. Because again, like there's various locations that you actually pick up fibers from. So it's being too too heavy handed on the wet palette, too heavy handed when you're drawing drying it on paper. And also, um, and also if you don't use a glove on your on your skin as well, you can also pick up hairs and things. Obviously, there are fine, tiny little hairs on, on your skin. You pick them up from there. Um so just to summarize this, you're saying that instead of using kitchen paper towel to dry your brush, because yeah. you might make little tears and get little bits of dust and fiber on the model yeah you're saying don't use the paper towel use a kitchen sponge yeah use one of those thin there's kitchen damp. sponges there's, there's, a, there's a little bit damp because the, the dampness will also mitigate the friction that the brush will happen if it's dry a sponge you're still going to create friction on that surface because it's animal hair but the, it being a little bit damp just means that it will kind of like help the brush to dry but without with the dampness will mitigate the friction so yeah you could also put the sponge in your mini fridge <laughs> to keep it down. Oh, the comments on the mini fridge are ridiculous. There's so many people that are saying that the fridge helped them. And did I'm sure the, it does. Welcome, the, but I'm not putting my palette in the fridge. Did you see the, the picture? Yeah. Was it uh, Chris on the Warrior? I think Was so. I'll put it on the, the screen. Chris on the Warrior team had a DIY wet palette, bomb my mom, bomb my mom jar in the, in the, in, in the mini yeah, fridge. Yeah, in the, in, in the fridge. Well done. Yeah, that's the way to go. I'm gonna I'm gonna tack on to the back of your hobby hack actually, because something that I've thought of uh, triple. Yeah, yeah, we're tri well, we're triple. Triple whammy. Yeah. There you go. Uh, one thing that I've started doing recently is because I'm <laughs> because I'm now at a point, particularly with my blood angels, where I'm not painting every single night like I used to be. Well, you don't need to tonight. You've got a shoulder pad. That's true. Very true. <laughs> uh, I'll notice that my models because they're sat like out on my hobby desk for like a couple of days between paint sessions. One way to avoid, obviously, they're going to get dust on them. But you, you, you think of like a model getting dusty as like leaving it on a shelf for like three weeks and then you come back and like, yeah, it's visibly dusty. But I noticed that even like overnight, if you look at a model the next day, it's that like fine, almost invisible layer of dust that you don't really see until you start putting paint on something and then realizing that all of a sudden there's little fibers in there. I know a lot of people buy those cheap makeup brushes for dry brushing. Yeah. 
odds are you bought those in a big pack. You might have a spare one that you haven't used before. And I say it's probably quite important that it's not been used before. Probably like a bigger one. Yeah, yeah. One of the big, big makeup brushes. And I get into the habit of before I paint now for any paint session, kind of regardless of how long the model's been left there. Just using that. If it's between paint sessions, just quickly dusting off the model in a downwards motion specifically uh, with that big makeup brush, just getting off any tiny little microscopic amount of dust. Do you know what? Is annoying. I do that, mm -hmm. so I could have nabbed that as a hobby hack, but I didn't. You know, didn't really think. Snooze your loose, Joe. Didn't really think. Well, it. Your, your wisdom, wisdom didn't come to. I it. The wisdom thought, didn't find the people I mean? for the episode. So I just thought everyone does that, and it so yeah. didn't yeah. really think it was worth saying. But oh, what I thought you were going to go with, which is another thing that I started doing, just the fourth hobby hack. <laughs> this is the fourth hobby hack of the, the <laughs> extra episode. value episode. Um, no, episode like, 50, we're giving people some it's special, like, it's special like tips. four hobby hacks that aren't worthy of being a single Yeah, but it's like a Megazord. Hack. It's like Power Rangers. They come together and they yeah, make yeah, one yeah. hobby hack. A mega um, hack. So I, my like shelving, <laughs> my shelving unit, like next to where my desk is, is one of the Ikea Kallax. Yep. People get them from storing records mostly. So the cube one. The cube it? one, yeah. yeah. And one of the... Uh, like, Units. Well, no, one of the uh, like add-ons you can get for that, you can get multitude of different like types of drawers and things you put on it. One that you can get is like a glass cab, turn it into a glass mm -hmm. section, basically. So they, do, like they a, do two. Is yours the one with the door or the one with the door and the shelf? The, the door and the shelf in mm -hmm. it. So I've got like two areas to put models in and then it closes. And I've been, anything that's like mid being painted or it's base coated or something or whatever, that goes in there. And I found that that stops a lot of the dust getting on there. Yeah, I agree. I've got one of the hobby zone, uh, like almost they like have a little display, like display box things that goes yeah. into your into your they setup. Have like a plastic case in over yeah. it. Then they're, it or they're really yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there you go. Well, I guess if you really want to go that way, just put it in a drawer. You, you can't that look way. at it then. How boring is that? I yeah. don't want to look at my half painted models and have them just like shaming me in a cabinet above my desk. I want to no. pretend that it's not a problem. Yeah, that's true, I suppose. <laughs> Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you everyone for listening to this very special episode 50 of Paint Perspective. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so in a number of ways. But number one is our Patreon. If you check the link in the description of this episode, you'll find a link to our Patreon where you can support the show over there. And please check out the Siege Studios website, get in your commissions, and you can check out some of our amazing products like the Onyx Lamp. Thank you everyone. We will see you next week. 